Hi everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker is ready to go. This is Marco and he'll be talking about that data streaming platform with Kafka and Java. Hope you enjoy. Take it easy. Thank you. Does everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. So, um, can we put the presentation on? Sorry. Thanks. So thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Marko Ivanovic. I'm coming from Tsuki. I'll be talking to you with some experience from creating data stream platform using Kafka, um, Java, and a little bit of Docker. Maybe, maybe most Docker than everything, but okay. So uh, for starters, I'm actually not going to show that much slides and so on. I'm actually going to show you some code and do some demoing. So if you want to check out the code, there's a public repo. Um, I'll, I'll leave it later for the Q&A if you also want to check it out. And if you have some questions or suggestions from that site, be free to ping me. So let's start. So first, just in short, maybe um, I'm aware probably that all of you probably know what Kafka is, but in short, what is Kafka? So Kafka is distributed event store and processing platform. So uh, what's the difference between the standard uh, messaging systems and Kafka? Kafka also supports um, uh, the storage of the, of the messages. So standard Q and A, uh, Q and A, sorry. <laughs> Q messages uh, can be actually lost in the sense of processing. So Kafka kind of supports that out of the fly that actually messages do persist and that there is a bit of different mechanism using this client ID and synchronization of who read the messages so that the messages technically don't get lost. So a little bit hint from the experience, they uh, really do uh, commercializing that Kafka never loses the messages and from our five project experience, we always lost messages. So <laughs> it's not perfect, but yeah, it works really, really quite better than, than every other system. So. Uh, let's start actually with, with uh, the, the, um, the setup itself. So when we talk about uh, the uh, data stream platforms or in any kind of da data processing platforms, um, there are a couple of points that you need to kind of note when you design. It's a little bit different than designing the standard web applications or, or any kind of even actually event systems. The point is that this platform actually needs to kind of serve you as a Pl pluggable and play uh, uh, platform. Why pluggable? That means that the platform is actually not when you develop it once, it stays like this. It's actually uh, configurations, joints of configurations that you can actually change during the execution. But the main point is that the data stream is never interrupted and there is no, <laughs> there's no data loss. But of course, yeah, going back to the one that Kafka actually loses some messages, but it's not the point. The point is that you deliberately don't remove some of the messages or change the content of the message or, or the data itself that you're streaming. So it really needs to serve as a platform to you and customers. So uh, how to actually use Kafka? I will actually show you what I did here. I used Docker and used uh, some of the, the Docker images to, to set it up. And um, most of these things there, not everything is actually on the Git repo yet. I will push it in during this week. Uh, but the setup for the Kafka, I use the Kafka, the, the Docker Compose actually to set up the whole Kafka. But I just want to go through you this basic four components that you would need from the Kafka and the solution that, that it serves to actually develop your, your um, data streaming platform. So the first one is Kafka itself. So uh, the Kafka broker, the Kafka cluster where the brokers are actually maintaining uh, the, the message mechanism. So it's a subscriber and producer mechanism. Uh, it takes care of the uh, it takes care of the, the the topics themselves. So Kafka actually serves the message via topics and provides this mechanism. And also, there's this schema registry that actually helps you to kind of maintain what messages are we talking about. Because technically, actually, in this example, I didn't use schema registry just to show you the example that you can also do it without it. But if you want to have the control, like what are you actually serving through your data platform and for your producers to know how to process the messages, the schema registry is actually a solution for that. Additionally, what I added here is the zookeeper. I think Kafka, although it can be standalone, it can live without the zookeeper. It's really the zookeeper is the master of the Kafka. It, it helps her survive all the crashes uh, due to reputation. There, there are mechanisms how uh, the, re the replicas, for example, for the topics are managed, how uh, backup systems are managed and so on. So actually to make Kafka resilient as possible, which is one of the greatest features from Kafka. So Zookeeper is 
actually it's going to be phased out soon because they are enhancing Kafka that you can actually do it with the Kafka itself, but what they're literally doing is copying tools from Zookeeper to Kafka, so just doing a bit of shuffling and a little bit of modernization. So uh, this is actually the Docker Compose. I have these four components running together, and I have here actually in this uh, repo that, that I mentioned, I have here Docker Compose so you can actually have a look at it. I hope you can see it, okay? So, in short, it's it just a, a simple setup where you actually download the, the Docker images uh, of uh, these four components. Uh, there are different vendors from Docker images, but the most popular one is the Confluent. The Confluent is actually the ones that it's actually uh, now uh, um, giving the money to the guys that are developing Kafka still. So, yeah, probably the safest image will be from their side. So. What we need to do is to actually get to the zookeeper and do the setup of the zookeeper. Uh, there's a really nice documentation again on the Confluent itself. I will show you the, the link a bit later. Um, and expose the image and the, the, let's say the port so that the Kafka and whoever actually depends on the zookeeper can, can communicate. The next one is the Kafka itself. So you can also um, connect to the zookeeper so that actually you can manage with the zookeeper and the zookeeper takes care of Kafka goes down or if there's some issues. And of course, the additional tools, as I mentioned, the schema registry, and this one I still didn't uh, mention, but it's a really powerful tool. Unfortunately, uh, 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 the, the part of it, it's not working for my demo, but I'll fix it, so I will push it to the repo so you can have a look. But it's actually the Kafka Connected. What is the Kafka Connected? It's additional server where you can actually use your data stream platform because we are, when we talk about Kafka, we talk about sending messages between the topics and processors actually processing those messages. But if you want to integrate like external data like uh, uh, Elasticsearch to actually push the topic content to the Elasticsearch and make it searchable, visible through Kibana or some other tool, or if you want to actually store some, create some maybe store procedures and really hard uh, backups to actually put it to the database or export some reports or some product of this data stream you can do with, these, with this uh, Kafka Connect. This is literally a web service where you actually have a REST exposed, I will show you a bit later, uh, where you can actually push different uh, connectors uh, that are simply jars that are actually running in the background and you can configure them to connect to these sources and either pull the data to the topics themselves and make it available to the platform itself or to actually expo export the data in any other consumers that you want that are not in the Kafka uh, solution itself. So there's a lot of kind of configuration there. Don't worry if you miss a configuration, Docker will not allow you to run it. So if you miss it, it will say, oh, I cannot run it. So you know that you're missing some configuration, but this is pretty much the simplest configuration that you can have for your data platform. So uh, once when I run it, when you have Kafka up and running, you can start actually doing the management of the topic. So there are no created topics by default. You need to create the topics on your own because you are uh, the master of your data. So you're creating the, the topics that are going to serve for your data platform. And you, have, you need to start from the topics because <laughs> you need to store some data somewhere. And there are actually nice tools, uh, and this is not the nicest tool, but it's most the practical tool, where you can actually connect to the Kafka itself. And here, as you can see, I hope you can see, okay. Uh, there you can see all the topics that uh, are used by this, uh, let's say, cluster now that I created in the Docker, so the Docker Compose that it's running. And here you can see all the topics, you can see their uh, configuration and properties, you can actually also change the display part if you want, you can check if there are any messages. And for now, some of these topics are not filled. For the Kafka Connect, actually any additional service that Kafka serves, actually it uses its own infrastructure. So if it needs to store configuration or any internal changes or actually hold the setup, it also uses the topics. So for example, the Kafka Connect has these three different topics that are actually uh, uh, holding the data that uh, Kafka needs to start and restart. Now, of course, for us, this is gibberish, but Kafka understands it. The reason why it's gibberish is because by default, all the data is, is uh, stored in the topics as byte array. So if you want to read it, you need to do the, the, uh, the mapping of, not the mapping, but uh, let's say the processing of these byte arrays. As I mentioned, schema registry is one of the tools that you can actually use, define the schema either in JSON or in Avro, 
or any other format that you want to use that can process the byte array data so that you can understand it and maybe even generate the Java code from it and work with that. So um, let's actually kind of now use our setup. So I'm a big fan of the skies. <laughs> I, love, I love stars, I love astronomy, I love everything, not astrology, astronomy, I always need to correct myself. Uh, so yeah, I always use it as a, as a topic for any of my code demos and so on. So um, in this case, what I wanted to create my data platform that actually we have some telescope that looks at the skies and picks up all different objects and sends the data about them and then we start processing it. So for this one, let's have a quick look at the code. So for the Java development, you actually have a lot of, and probably mostly for the Java for some reason and from Kotlin. Uh, from the Confluent itself, you have a lot of libraries that you can use. So Kafka, producer, consumer, if you want to create it, you actually have uh, libraries from their side that you can pull in as, with the Maven and create it. There is also this Kafka streams, I'll look at in the other example, which you can also actually use and process the streams. It has really nice features to have a control of the topology, how you actually manage the topics, what do you do with the data transformation, how you manage the topics further. So in this case, it's pretty much simple. Yeah, it's not the prettiest code, but it's simple code just for example. Uh, what we need, we need actually a target topic because this is actually the first consumer, uh, the pr first producer that we have. We want to populate our first topic so that we start getting the data. And what we need, we need the target topic, which we extracted in the, in the um, properties. The reason that I did it, as I mentioned at the beginning, whatever you develop for a platform, try to make it from the design perspective to be configurable. So don't go with two generic solutions. You can be specific and it is data-driven design <clears throat> in most cases, sorry. But any changes like uh, to the broker itself, to the topics that you want to process, to maybe some rules, whatever you can extract as a configuration, extract it because it will be much easier to maintain it and manage it. Uh, for the producer itself, what it needs to run is actually, for starters, the, uh, the bootstrap itself where the Kafka is running. So this is really the Kafka image itself from, from that uh, Docker. And the uh, client ID is just to identify to the Kafka itself, okay, who is the producer? You can actually have multiple producers to the same topic. So Kafka actually also has internal topics which stores the configuration sorry, just a second, uh, stores uh, all the, let's say, the configuration, so it receives the client in it and it uh, marks that this client actually also wrote to this topic. Yes? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, of course. Um, oh, yeah, my, my really stuck. Why is not, okay, my... Does somebody have an idea? I, I tried with the scroll, but it doesn't work. Okay, sorry about that. So yeah, in, in short, maybe let's do it like this. God damn it, of course, demo effect. Okay, now it's better. <laughs> so yeah, if you don't see, just interrupt me and, and say I'll, I'll plug it in because yeah, my mouse, it seems screwed from some reason. So. In short, this is like a base setup. It's both for producer and consumer, so it needs to know where to communicate. And the ID itself, the difference for the consumer is that in this case, Kafka is actually using the mechanism to know if the consumer actually read the message. So in the JAR implementations, be careful if you use them, there's this auto commit configured, which means whenever you read the message, regardless if you process it, you will see later in the other example, if you process it or not, if there is an exception, to, there is an auto commit that comes behind it. So that means that we tell as a consumer Kafka, yes, we read the message and then Kafka will say for our client, this is the la latest ID or index of the message that you read, which means that when we restart, we want to try to solve the bug and we restart, we actually lost that message. So if you want to actually have a control, you can actually set the auto commit to false. And then you can explicitly do the commits in synchronous or asynchronous way as you want, but only when you finish with the processing itself. But by default, we learned that the hard way, there is an auto commit. So yeah, that means that the client will lose the message. There are additional configurations where you can say, always oh, start from the beginning, or you can just simply change the client ID and then it will start again from as a new client. So now uh, um, just to look from the code itself, 
from the Kafka, there's nothing much there. It's just to create the Kafka producer with these properties as I mentioned. Additional, what you need to configure. Can you see this at least? Yeah. Uh, what, the, what you need to configure is the key serializer and value serializer, and for both for the consumer, the deserialization part. Uh, they are responsible for actually uh, understanding this byte array. As I said, the content is bytes. So it needs to figure out, okay, how to do it. And they are actually key of the message, the message body, and the header itself. Uh, but uh, for the header itself is by default, I think, the plain text. You can configure it a bit differently, but to be honest, I didn't see that nobody's using the header for Kafka. So uh, the keys are important because by default, the Kafka uses the keys of the message to do the partition of the topics if you introduce the partition. So you can configure it differently, but by default, this is the key that it uses, and it also ensures that if you send the same message with the same key, that it will actually have the content and that it, end, it ends up in the correct partition itself. So we create the Kafka producer. Here are just some random gibberish that I generated. There are some data to see soon. And you just simply say producer sent. This is actually a future task. So it can also be a trick if you just do producer send what we did and don't check if uh, the task is complete. Uh, the, 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 the library mechanism is actually not going to tell you if there's an error of the receiving of the message or not. So you need to have your own mechanism. Of course, again, <clears throat> there are mechanisms, but you need to configure them. So they configure like to have the minimal functionality, but if you don't configure this error handling and logging on the proper way, you can get lost. So this is one of the tips for the, for the platform itself. And here, simply, let's just actually start it. What it does, it just produces the, the, let's say, the telescope feed. And I just use it to actually say, OK, it does on every one and a half second. If you do it like this, it will just bombard the topic. And yes, of course, this is actually the point of Kafka, because it can handle a lot of messages uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, but for this demo, I just want it to be humane so that you can read it. So we're just sending some data about, OK, if this, uh, they have the content of the data is more like, okay, what is the path? It is orbital path or straight path and so on. What are the colors of this object that it's seen? What is the size and what is the, the velocity? Is it fast or slow and so on? If there are some flashing lights and you will see later the reasons why we all need this data, but it's simulated that it's kind of visual perception from the telescope itself. So now what we see there, we are sending the data. Let's see where are we sending. So there's this topic telescope feed. As you can see, um, this tool actually doesn't provide you that much of an options for the key itself, but usually the key is uh, either some um, kind of thought through value because you can also use the key in your logical way because the keys are, uh, let's say, available in the processors themselves. But if you use something like random, like I did for timestamp and so on, uh, unfortunately, here you can only see it as a byte array. If you try it as a string, it's not going to show it nicely, but let's look at the data. So here you can actually see that we have the data and the topic, and here it actually shows nicely the information additionally to the topic. So for this topic, this topic is created only with one partition. If you would have multiple partitions, you will see uh, different values here. The offset is the one that we talked about that actually client ID, when it reads the message, gets this data. So when you start your client, the Kafka will check for your client ID, what is the latest offset, what is the latest offset that it read. And based on that, it will know, OK, from, from where to continue further. There's also a timestamp by default, so that you can also kind of do, if you want to do the search through any tools, you can also do it through the timestamp itself. There is also actually a Java library that is called Kafka Admin, where all these tools and all the administrations that also Zookeeper does and so on is available for here. So you only con connect to the Kafka broker itself, and everything is available to you. Of course, if you take care of some Q-theory, if somebody else can yeah, connect, then they can actually bring down the Kafka again, also from, the, yeah, from our experience, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, here you can also see, if you click on a topic, you see what, what is the content here. And this is pretty much it, let's say, the, 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 the demo for, for producer itself. Now, let's see what, what we can do here. So, now we actually have uh, the producer that actually develops our own first topic. So now let's start reading the topic. I have another one that is called Celestial Categorizer. 
And there are actually typos here, by the way, so don't judge me, but there is also important message behind these typos. It wasn't deliberate, but it worked. <laughs> here, now we actually have a example of Kafka Stream processor. So we are using the Kafka Stream library where we are actually now processing the stream itself. And this is the important part where we talk about the design perspective. And when you develop monolith or microservices and so on, yes, we talk about also the flow itself, but we're mostly around the business logic. When you develop the platform itself, you actually try to decouple as much as possible from the business logic, but keep it in the data itself. But when you design the solution itself, you actually try not to stop the flow or any way jeopardize the flow or the content of the data. So this is one of the most important let's say, features of the data stream platform itself. So here, what are we doing? We are actually going to read two things. We have the telescope feed topic, which we just populated. We also have this metadata topic. This is the JDBC one that I mentioned. So there is a JDBC connector in this Kafka Connect itself that stopped working from some reason, but okay. What it actually does, it reads the content from the, the table that I set up but it's also in the, in the Docker, by the way. And what it does, it actually extracts this data so you can use both tables and views, and you can actually populate this data into the topic and actually then make it as a topic uh, data available to your platform. The difference between the, uh, this um, standard feed and this feed is that this JDBC connector or any kind of data connector will only react to the data changes. So it's not going to continuously feed the same topic with the same data, but it's actually going to react to the changes in the database and then actually um, push the data to the topic itself. So this is usually in data stream platforms used for configurations, for any uh, um, security maybe configurations or maybe to actually customization for your clients if you want to change the flow, if you want to change how some processor behaves or you want to derive it from the behavior from the data itself. So um, it's a bit tricky when, when you first wrap your head on it, but once when you get used to the design, it's much easier to actually develop. So in short, I can also show you this topic. So there is this nice DB celestial metadata topic and currently only has four records. So what I did here, I tried to kind of use to kind of describe, okay, um, how can we recognize what are asteroids? And by the way, there's this typo, if you can see asteroids, but it's important. I will tell you why later. Uh, and kind of, let's say, based on this visual behavior, try to define these four categories, or so stars, planets, aliens. <laughs> if we see that something is moving fast and flashing lights and so on, erratic, probably they're aliens. And uh, of course, we have this ast asteroids from this point. So what do we have? We have two topics. And if we run this bad boy here, what it's going to do is going to do the following. Now there is this implementation. Uh, I'll, I'll run it a little bit in background until I explain it. So there's this implementation from the Kafka streams. You will see here now global table and K stream. And what this means is that we are actually using this metadata topic to build this so-called global table. And this is exactly telling Kafka to actually uh, provide you this join feature. But the point is that you can also join streams or you can also join these tables. They are technically topics in the background, but the point is that somebody needs to drive the join. So in this case, it makes sense that our data flow drives the join. So whenever our data comes in, it will trigger the join itself with the metadata. But because the metadata if it changes, but there's no data, doesn't make sense to trigger the join, then we say, okay, we want to actually use the stream. And that's why when you also <clears throat> do these joins, if you see it here, hopefully, if not, you will see it in uh, Git. Uh, when you do these joins, you can join it from the stream and you have join and left join. It doesn't make sense to have a right join because you don't want to have like empty match with the metadata. What is the cool thing is that here, uh, and maybe the bad thing, when you use global table, the join is done based on the, what is the key for the global table in the, in the topic. So when you design the, these kind of topics that come from some source, you need to have the meaningful ID, as I mentioned before. But for what is cool for the stream itself, if you're actually doing the join based on some logic processing of the stream itself, you can actually use this uh, uh, join a key mapper where you actually define how you build your key, which you're going to join against the table itself from the stream. 
So it's not, it doesn't need to match from the key of the stream. It tells something that doesn't make sense to do that. But you can actually drive your key to do the join. And then there's this value builder, which in this case, I just concatenated these two values and then pushed it to the stream. And now what is a cool thing besides this joining, which can be used for filtering, if you want to filter the data and actually create a new flow, let's say we want only to see planets and so on, you can actually create a new flow and we're actually doing this. But here, the first part is only joining the stream. So there's no still filtering of the data I'm rematching, but you can also do the split and then branch. It's a bit weird how it's done, but then you can mark, I want to do the split. And then you define the branches where this topic come from. The only downside is that if you don't define the branch that actually matches the, the value of the matcher, the data will actually not be processed further. It will be joined, but it will not go processed further. But important, it will not disappear from the original topic. As I mentioned before at the beginning, Kafka actually does the storage of the messages and you can configure it. How long does it delete them after some time? Does it compact them? But it is really important to understand really this big difference against any other, I mean, there are similar solutions, but most of the messaging solutions work this way. If you process the message, it's gone. And here we actually just used three new topics, which we have planet topic, star topic, and asteroids topic. <laughs> but here, for example, what I did here, oh yeah, now there is no typo, but if you look at the configuration, yes, there is a typo. And this is really important. This killed us when we did typos and we figured out why it doesn't work because it will tell you you don't have rights to this topic or this topic is not existing and then you need to jump in to Zookeeper and then Zookeeper tells you the truth. So it's a bit tricky if you don't pay attention to it. So either for the joining as well, I, I, I was using also this category to actually do the filtering, but because the category itself is also typoed, I need to use the typo. So if you already generate the mass of data you kind of need to handle it somehow. So yeah, it's not, it's not a pretty solution, but yeah, there are ways that you can actually fix the data, but it costs a lot. So since this is a stream, and as I said, the main purpose of your data stream platform is to keep the stream flowing and keep the data consistent as it is. So not to change the content of the data if there's no really purpose behind it. So what is this guy doing? It's actually populating now, actually all these other topics. So now we have asteroids, and now if you look at this nice joint that I did here, you can see that it's all category asteroids. We also have the, the, the planets themselves. We have others that we're currently not using, but it's there. So there, if there's no data, the topic can still exist, of course. We have stars. So now we actually split the, 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 the content of these topics. And What's the point here now is that if you look at it now, I actually have here the data itself from the database that I pulled with the JDBC connector. And now see that we defined also aliens. So let's maybe quickly have two more minutes to actually do the alien. I will leave so to, to actually answer a couple of questions if somebody wants to actually stay. But simply here, what we do is we just create another branch. I'll need to remove this one. And of course, to actually stop this, please stop. <coughs> and since I didn't define this topic, I'll just use it here directly. You can also do that, but it's not recommended. As I said, try to do as much as configuration as possible. And we need to create a topic here. And here it's actually just pretty much simple. Just click create topic aliens and you're done aliens sorry i am not alien as i said i'm a king of typos sorry and now if we run this one again hopefully it doesn't break but yeah demo effect let's see now let's go and check if we have some aliens already I need to find it here. Okay, we still didn't find any aliens. But yeah, um, this is just actually kind of demonstrating how, how, how it should be configured. So it should be that easy configured. If you need a new stream, a new flow, you need to, to have it this option like this. So just to summarize it, what we saw here, yeah, let me go to the full mode just quickly. 
what we had here, we had this, uh, the source, we had the, the metadata source, we had this categorizer that we created the new topics, and this is your platform. What it derives from here is that you can actually then start producing your data to the clients and sell the value of the data itself. So if you want to yeah, have big asteroids filter to figure out if you're going to die, then you need to put it in elastic and then maybe somebody creates a new Independence Day movie. And if you check from the planets, maybe see if there are some new planets, maybe we can try to habitable. And of course, if we detect aliens, maybe we can start storing reasons why we should move from the Earth itself. And yeah, that's it from my side. Wise on time. <laughs> Thank you.